So everyone exists in proximity to whiteness. So what does it mean to be mindful of one's proximity to whiteness? Glad to have you amazing viewer. It's another interesting topic and I'm here for educational purposes. Thank you so much for joining Comfort for Life Network. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to turn on the bell so that you get notified whenever I have a new video. Before we get to look at how this proximity to whiteness impacts individuals in the society it's important for us to understand first what is this proximity to whiteness what does it refer to so this is the idea that in a society where white culture and norms are dominant all individuals regardless of their racial background exist within a framework that privileges whiteness that means that our this video is linked to the previous video that i have shared of assimilation you know people get to assimilate to receive the privileges because you can't be in a society where uh, some people are benefiting of some advantages or uh, some privileges that you can't receive so people find it better to assimilate and some even assimilate to the point that they 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 change their identity, they change everything about them so that they can completely be part of that whiteness. That explains the reason why we have terms like white passing, white presenting, and so many other terms that we can refer to. But is it easy to really assimilate and completely look like them to get to the uh, benefit of all these privileges? So listen to how are this our proximity to whiteness impacts individuals in the society listen to this and who are the most affected by this listen to this so everyone exists in proximity to whiteness so what does it mean to be mindful of one's proximity to whiteness so let's talk about this and in particular what it means for people of color first we need to understand what we mean by whiteness according to whiteness theory this is the idea that possessing white skin is to be normal to the point of being invisible or unremarkable that is to say you're not really thinking about it in your day-to-day -day lives and therefore to not have white skin is to exist on a spectrum of marginality wherein the lightest skin is the most advantageous and being the darkest skinned is to be the most stigmatized and so in the united states historically whiteness has been the standard against which all the rest of us have been measured even still so much so that even someone like myself who's particularly light-skinned still gets some degree of pushback for not being white enough whatever that happens to mean but let's take a more complex view of this because whiteness is a foundational sociocultural power structure in the United States that works in conjunction with other extremely important sociocultural power structures. So for example, here's a non-exhaustive list. Let's consider ableism, patriarchy, and elitism. Now, all of these systems of power are so deeply entangled with each other that I would suggest that it is at best not as productive as it could be to address each one in isolation because then we get a diminished view of how these things operate in uh, time and space. And at worst, it's counterproductive because we may be actually obscuring how some of these other sociocultural systems are intertwining with each other and causing material consequence. That is to say that when conducting analysis, it's important to consider at least a couple different intersections. We can't cover everything, but at least we can get a broader view of a phenomenon that way. So what this means for white folks is that you gotta think of your whiteness as existing on a spectrum, right? And so where you're on that spectrum is determined by where you are in regard to those other sociocultural systems of power. And so things may change for you. You may move up or down on that spectrum, but you're always going to possess whiteness. What this means for people of color is that because these social systems are so enmeshed, as we do things like go to college, get a profession, dress a certain way, perform gender in a certain way, or even talk in a certain way, that we are climbing higher in these hierarchies and thus becoming closer to whiteness. Now going to an Ivy League school will not change the color of your skin. However, it will put you in spaces that were designed for what I refer to as apex whiteness. That is to say, uh, the height of the overlap of these social systems. And my observation is that it can become easy to be content or complacent when you become accustomed to navigating these spaces of apex whiteness. And so my thought is that we must be mindful that as we increase our proximity to whiteness, so too does our responsibility to other marginalized people increase. What I need people to understand when I, me, this guy, talks about white people and whiteness, I am not talking about white people in terms of you being born white is a sin that you need to atone for. I feel like I think a lot of people on this app always assume they don't really hear what I'm saying. So I'm trying to make this video to make it as clear as possible. When I'm talking about whiteness, I'm talking about the bubble of whiteness, that bubble that insulates people who are deemed white from 
uh, the basically the realities of the world by creating this sort of field around themselves in which they look through, like a certain lens that they examine the world through, and that how they are also perceived. And because of things like white supremacy, this bubble has gotten very, very, very good at not being noticed, at least by those within the bubble. Think of it like a one-way mirror. So people inside the bubble of whiteness don't see what everyone outside the bubble always sees. Someone from what's inside the bubble of whiteness might look at another group and be like, wow, those people are lazy and they want handouts. Meanwhile, on top of their bubble, those people can see the fact that people within that bubble have been given advantages that they themselves were denied. And what that might look like, just for one example, is through your bubble, you're looking at black people talking about reparations and saying, well, they just want handouts from the government because they weren't alive when that stuff happened. So why should they benefit from that? Meanwhile, people who are outside the bubble are looking at you like you have also benefited from government aid because you can most likely trace back your lineage to, you know, when the government was subsidizing housing loans specifically for white people to move out into the suburbs and giving them things at cost. So easily to build up their fortune. And on top of that, black people and other minorities were not encouraged to work or could not work in certain places. So you had a huge head start, which would also be an advantage, which would also be, you know, again, government handouts. That also bleeds to my another point I want to make. And when we talk about the fragility of whiteness, we say it's fragile, at least I should say I say it's fragile because it cannot handle the same level of scrutiny that it allows those within the bubble of whiteness to dish out. And again, what that may look like is, again, what's inside that bubble, you are looking at the black man going, wow, the black man is so violent. There's no accountability there. There's nothing there. And then when we talk about the fact that most mass shooters are white males, it's no longer community. It's individual based. It's not representative of the whole community, but only for people within the bubble. Outside the bubble, it's all representative of the community. Like that's, you can tell it's, it's very fragile. It cannot handle what it dishes out. It's a glass cannon of a shield. And this last point is for the minorities who want to get a piece of that whiteness. You can tell who they are because they will try to take as much as they can from that bubble and hopefully think they can pass through it and join inside that bubble. So it's like the minorities who will say stuff like, yeah, you know what? I'm black and I don't have, I'm not offended by someone saying the N-word or I'm X minority and I'm okay if Y people say Z about us because at the end of the day, what does it matter? See, they're hoping at the end of the day that they take enough of that bubble to where the bubble recognizes it as itself and lets it in, expanding its bubble. And then they try to make it more obvious by pointing out the fact that people outside the bubble want the bubble to be bursted and not to be expanded. So moving on, how do outsiders view somebody who has a close proximity to whiteness? So this lady had received a comment uh, that she was addressing in the comment section. I have a close proximity to whiteness that upholds white supremacy. If only my kindergarten class agreed with you. Because I went to kindergarten and I was the only black kid in my class. Fun fact, they made me play the bad guy at every recess because I was the dark one. But sure, white supremacy. You have facial features and hair that upholds white supremacy. What? <laughs> Okay, let's break this down. From a genetic perspective, most of my facial features are African, bigger nose, bigger lips, because they're dominant genes. As far as hair is concerned, I don't know how this is white. Oh my gosh, did you just give me white privilege? Thank you. I wanna have a little conversation that may not make everyone watching this video feel good, but it's a conversation that I think needs to be had and it's a topic that keeps coming up in a lot of consultations I have with my clients. And I think we have to have a conversation about the fact that some of us, and when I say us, I mean black and brown people, the quote, people of color. And I don't consider black people, especially black Americans are not people of color, we're black people. But all the other non-black people in American corporate workspaces, I want to talk to some of you and if it if, you know if it doesn't apply to you then feel good about that but if you feel triggered by anything that I'm saying then I'm probably talking about you and you need to unpack that and you need to seriously figure out how to do differently and how to do better it is very clear to anyone that understands white supremacy and racism in the United States that anti-black racism is the foundation of all other isms in American society and without the civil rights movement, 
all other groups besides black Americans would have no rights in the United States. Um, the United States did not even start to uh, allow immigration of black and brown people into this country until after many of the civil rights laws were passed. That's a fact, you can go look it up. Google is your friend. So it pains me to hear and see, and I've experienced a lot of this myself, black and brown immigrants coming into the United States and uh, engaging with corporate workplaces and aligning themselves with whiteness and against black Americans in workplaces. And I understand where a lot of it comes from. I mean, most of these countries, continents, Asia, Southeast Asia particularly, but all of Asia and uh, Africa as well, were colonized. So while your ancestors may not have been slaved physically, some of y'all, your minds were colonized and your countries were colonized. And some of them continue to be controlled by European countries from a financial perspective and socially. And so there's this desire for proximity with whiteness that has been taught over centuries to people from India, China, even though China was never colonized, but Chinese Americans come to the, you know, Chinese immigrants come to the United States and we see a lot of, a lot of this as well in that population and African immigrants and Caribbean immigrants. And I speak of this as a person who was raised by West Indian parents. I'm a first generation American. I was born in the United States and I consider myself to be black, black, blackity black, as I tell people all the time. That's how I feel. I don't call myself West Indian American, a Caribbean American, I'm black American. But I have interacted with many other people from the Caribbean diaspora who do everything they can to try to say that they're not black like black Americans and I'm Caribbean American and I'm this American. No, you're black. And I want to say very clearly to you, all of you, that white proximity will not save you. They don't consider you to be equal to them any more than they consider black Americans and they don't like you better. And so actively and intentionally seeking proximity to whiteness may harm your black American brothers and sisters, but it's not going to save you at the end of the day. And so I really want to speak to those of you who feel that you're superior in some way to black Americans and come to the United States and look down on black Americans, come into workplaces, and when you receive promotions and positions of authority, actively oppress black Americans, stop it. Cut it out. Because eventually, as the late great Paul Mooney said, every black person in America, black or brown, you're going to get your nigga wake up call eventually. All of us have had to have it. No matter how far up the pool we went and how high up we think we are, we all get the wake up call eventually. And it's painful whenever it comes. It's especially painful when you didn't expect it because you thought that you were somehow different or better. You're not. All of us as black and brown people are not treated, treated or considered on par. And I don't care whether you think you are model immigrant or whatever it is. I don't care how many degrees you have, where, what university you went to. You're not better. And ultimately, you will learn that you're not better. But it is not okay to inflict oppression on other people that look like you because you think that you're better than them somehow. And because you think that your white counterparts tell you that you're articulate, you speak well, and you're not like them. When a white person tells you that you're not like them, that's not a compliment. It's not a compliment. Don't think it's a compliment. But they will use you against your own if you let them. And too many of us in workplaces, including some of us who are black American, we desire proximity to whiteness. And that desire allows us to do things that are unconscionably horrible. I, I can tell you that my very first encounter with a discriminatory hostile work environment was at the hands of a black American woman. So I'm not just talking to those of you who are immigrants, I'm talking to all of us as black people and all of us as black and brown people, but I'm especially talking to those who call themselves people of color. 
and those with immigrant backgrounds because there's a lot of this happening. I have a lot of potential and clients who are coming out of tech. Black women in tech are catching hell and they're usually catching hell from immigrant supervisors who are doing the dirty work for their overseers, okay? And I really want us to recognize that this is happening in our communities and be willing to face up to it and agree to do something about it. When you catch yourself thinking that a black, another black person is problematic and you somehow feel superior to them, you need to stop and ask yourself why and where that is coming from. If, you, if somebody is messing up at work, you should pull them to the side and try to help them to do better rather than aligning yourself with your overseers and trying to push them out of their job, right? There are too many who are doing that kind of thing in American workplaces and it is very destructive and at the end of the day, it's not gonna save you and it's not gonna make them like you better. So at the end of the day, what is the point? Why, why do it? to others that, that, that are in the same group as you. And when I say that, I mean we're all ethnic minorities in the United States. And at the end of the day, that is how we are all treated. And while there might be levels to that sucker, white supremacy is white supremacy. And too many of us are doing the work where they don't even have to do it themselves anymore because we're doing it for them. We're allowing ourselves to be used as perpetuators of white supremacy in white corporate workspaces and American workspaces. And we have got to cut that out because it's really harming us as a group. And it is used to divide us so that they can continue to be at the top of the food chain. And so I really want to say to you guys who are working in these spaces, check yourselves. So I really would like us to, as people of color, uh, those of you who consider yourself to be people of color, um, and I'm not talking to black Americans here, I'm talking to everyone else who considers themselves to be people of color, whether they can call themselves African um, immigrants or you're Asian American or whatever you call yourself. Don't be a tool of white supremacy in the name of white proximity because white proximity in the end of the day it's not going to save you. What is your thought on this? From what you've heard, I think that you should be having a solution. What is popping into your mind? So let's uh, type down there. What are your thoughts on this? From, from where I stand from, I kind of realize that unless those who are carrying the privileges uh, get to realize that they are upholding a system that is oppressing to others, that only benefits them because of who they are, so they will never be uh that that balance because most of the time people deny the white privilege which is something that is not a myth it's a reality isn't it so we are here to uh create that balance and one of the ways is those who are having those privileges to advocate on behalf of those who can't get those privileges on this channel it's all about inclusivity we want to make the world a better society to live in uh, don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comment section. That was it about this video, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Like the video for recommendation. Don't forget to leave your thoughts kindly. I love interacting. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I appreciate that you spent your precious time with me. Goodbye for now.